The topic of this talk is guaranteed spiritual. Whoops, I didn't say that. I was supposed to be guaranteed happiness formula, but a guaranteed spiritual happiness. Yes, I gave it away. I gave away the clue. Well, this title of this talk might attract many people because everyone is looking for happiness. It's almost a truism, isn't it? Everyone's looking for happiness. Everything we do, directly or indirectly, is meant for attaining happiness or at least mitigating distress. We want happiness. It might attract many people, the title, but quite likely not because there are so many people promising happiness practically the world's full of advertisements and everyone's got their own ideas. Buy this, buy this, buy that, do something else, go on holiday somewhere else. People in New York see advertisements, go on holiday to Mexico and people in Mexico see advertisements, go on holiday to New York. And <laughs> the grass is always greener on the other side, but it's not. Anyway, <clears throat> It might attract people to listen. If you're listening, well, if you're still listening after a minute or so of waff waffling along, uh, you may wonder, well, happiness? I gotta, I gotta be like this. I gotta put on these funny clothes and that yellow stuff on my head. Does that make you? Is there some kind of drug in the yellow stuff on your head? No, listen on, if you will. <clears throat> Most, anyway, what I say, most people won't believe it. It's not difficult to understand, but most people won't believe it. Uh, they, they believe that happiness comes from yeah, holidays, having a good job, money, cars, or bubble gum, having a strong, healthy body, having sex, booze, uh, what else? There may be people who are a bit more highbrow and happiness comes from poetry and good music. High, highbrow, intellectual discussion, living in nature, being nice to others, being good. These things bring happiness. Definitely this sex, booze, filling up the belly, eating all kinds of things for the pleasure of the tongue, trying to satisfy the genitals. This talk is definitely not for people who think that happiness comes from gross sense gratification. Indulging in the activities of the senses brings happiness. That is animalistic and it does not satisfy the soul or even the mind. We don't feel happy. This talk is about spiritual happiness. When we use the word spiritual, often people think about going and living in nature. But nature, what does that mean, nature? It means living outside the city. What is where will you find nature? Virgin forest? Uh, it's, not so, it's not so pleasant, actually, if you really go to the real wild forest. They're untouched by man. There are all kinds of creatures out to get you, bugs and snakes. And if they haven't been killed off, uh, various dangerous wild animals. It's hard to even get into nature. You know, people think they're walking in nature if they're walking in England's green and pleasant land in the hills and the dales, but it's all been, <laughs> it's all been uh, manicured and treated by man, just like the Yorkshire dales. Uh, there used to be forest. Uh, man interfered. Anyway, nature Simply to live in nature doesn't necessarily bring satisfaction. It's not spiritual. We, we should understand what spiritual means. 
uh, there are lots of spirits there in, 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 the, in as much as every living being is a spirit. And it's what is called in Bhagavad Gita sattva gun. It's more, it's closer to sattva gun, um, the mode of goodness as compared to the mode of passion and the mode of ignorance. So it can help us to get in a more spiritual consciousness. And certainly people who enjoy walks in the country, meditative walks in the country, they can be understood to be on a higher level of consciousness than, than uh, disco frequenters. But really spiritual means getting up to a higher level of consciousness, understanding what it means to be spiritual, uh, understanding. It's, it, where, where's, where's the guaranteed happiness formula here? We're talking, you know, what happened? It's, well, you have to listen and try and understand it. It's, it's something like this. If you want to be a doctor, okay, you want to be a doctor. It's a, quite an achievement. You have to go and study for some years. It's not such an easy thing. You have to apply yourself. So in the same, so you may think guaranteed happiness formula, just do, boom, click your fingers. It's, it's not such a cheap thing. You have to listen, and if you're prepared to follow the formula, uh, then you can take it. If you're not, well, you won't know whether, it's, whether it works or not, whether it's really, really a happiness formula, whether it's just a scam. You won't know if you don't try. Anyway, it's commonly thought that spirituality means merging into the oneness or the light. This is meaningless. It's nonsense. Why, what is this merging into? I am you and you are me and we are all together, sung the Beatles. But I am not you, you are not me. And John Lennon, I think it was he who sung it, maybe it was Paul McCartney. Anyway, John Lennon, uh, he didn't lead a happy life. He was famous, he was talking about peace and love, but he himself had, for all his millions of dollars and fame, he wasn't happy. That didn't bring him happiness, you see. Otherwise, why was he a drug addict? He wasn't happy. Anyway, this idea merging, that, that's a beetle from a Beatles song. I am you and you are me and we are all together. It's nonsense. And the, 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 the next line of that song goes, sitting on a cornflake waiting for the sun to come. If the sun don't come, you'll get a tan from sitting in the English rain. I am the walrus. It's meaningless to think, it's, it's, to say, I am the walrus sitting on a cornflake, it's all meaningless. And the idea of becoming one with everything. People may th think that they have spiritual experiences, but it's not a fact that we can become one with everything. Whatever that means, there's an idea that you, you merge into the oneness and you become God, but you don't become God. That's nonsense. God means who is supreme eternally. How can you become God? God means supreme. It's all some crazy ideas. At least we could say that people who seriously take to spiritual life, the, the first thing they have to understand is that actual happiness begins the, the beginning on the path of actual happiness begins when we understand that trying to be happy in material life is just an illusion. It's never going to happen. We have to find out who we actually are. What is our spiritual position? How are we going to find that out? Not by experiments. We have to find out from those who know. There are people who know. There was in the land in which I'm residing, which is presently known as India, or in Indian languages, in Sanskrit, Bharata, 
Bharata Varsha, Bharata Desha. There was for eons, and it's still going on in a somewhat truncated and often distorted way, a very strong spiritual culture in which many people, not everyone, but many people understood that spiritual understanding is most important. There was a search. It's technically called Atato Brahma Jignasa in Sanskrit language. Now we should inquire into the nature of spiritual reality. So we can inquire from persons who know, who have walked that path. Even in any mundane topic, uh, mundane means concerned with this material world. If we want to study physics, it's ridiculous to try to start out knowing nothing and try to experiment by ourselves and try to find out. Even to understand that there is such a discipline as physics, we have to take education. Uh, Newton was a genius in physics, but today, if, but by his contemplation, uh, he, and then he was able to bring out various uh, principles of physics. But today, if one studies physics, if one studies, we don't study at the level of Newton, we study further, because further contemplation, experimentation, uh, verification has gone on and physics has proceeded. So we have to learn from those who know. Of course, if we go further up and further on in physics, we'll find there are so many different opinions. It can be quite bewildering. But the point is, even, even to get to the point of understanding that there are so many uh, unsolved and unresolved mysteries in physics, we have to learn the basics. We have to learn from those who know. Even those who disagree at the higher level of physics, whether it's atomic physics or uh, in astrophysics, and they're all linked anyway. Even those who disagree on certain things, they all agree basically on the broad body of knowledge. Or that's, um, yeah, um, okay, all right. That's, that's, that's a generalization. Uh, so similarly in spiritual understanding, we have to, if we want to go anywhere, it's just, I, I'll do it by myself. It's a crazy idea. It's, it's ridiculous. We should take knowledge from those who have learned from the masters. There is verified knowledge, just like in physics, there is verified knowledge. Of course, there is a great difference between materialistic science and what we can call spiritual science because what has been discovered in materialistic science, what is known in the present age of mankind, the present time, has been discovered by human inquiry. And although that's also true in spiritual understanding, it's not simply by spiritual inquiry, but ex accepting knowledge coming down from a higher platform, from beyond the screen, from, be from beyond the universe, accepting that there is knowledge beyond that which we can discover simply by ourselves. So it means to accept this uh, knowledge and widely accepted as the introductory book of or treatise on spiritual knowledge, um, widely accepted as the introductory, but still very highly advanced. Um, just like if we say an introduction to astrophysics, if we have a book, an introduction to astrophysics, well, you have to be pretty advanced 
to even in in knowledge of physics to even begin to get into the introduction to astrophysics. So in the same way, although Bhagavad Gita is introductory knowledge of spiritual life, it is high knowledge. And it aims to bring us high. In this material existence, we are very low. We are mostly thinking in terms of our tongue, belly, and genitals, in terms of I, me, and mine. And that's why most people, uh, they, they, when they think of happiness, go and look on the internet. I did it a few months ago. Happiness, and look up photos, and you'll see people with huge smiles on their face. Uh, uh, it's the adrenaline, rush of adrenaline kind of happiness, but that's often followed by emptiness. Real happiness is sustained on a high platform. The rush of adrenaline that comes from uh, winning a race or from winning the lottery or, or th this kind of happiness, that's that's not happiness. It, it, well, you, I, I, it's self-defeating, isn't it, that statement? Well, the re it's so pathetic. It's so far away from what we as souls, as spiritual beings, crave in our inner hearts. It's actually pathetic. It's, it's sad to see the huge majority of the human race just looking for happiness at a really pathetic level, and not, not coming to what their real potential. Real potential means, first of all, we have to un understand who we are. Bhagavad Gita, the first thing, teaches us that we are eternal spiritual beings. This body is temporary. Yeah, we all know that. But I am not the body. We don't know that. Before this body existed, I existed. This body will surely die. Whatever exercises we do and potions we drink and avoiding polluted air, whatever, it's going to die. But I will continue to live. This is the first teaching of Bhagavad Gita, that we are all eternal, spiritual, living beings. We have spiritual needs. What The needs of our body are temporary. We need to fulfill them, but our whole existence should not be centered simply on fulfilling the needs of the body. We need to understand the need of our soul and become situated in consciousness on the spiritual platform. According to our consciousness, at the time of death, the consciousness that we have accrued throughout life, we get future births. So if our consciousness is lifted to the spiritual platform, then we will come out of the cycle of birth and death and go to the spiritual world, which is our actual happy position. To give a mundane analogy, which is, it's not complete, but we have to give some kind of analogy to help us understand. A fish can never be happy outside water. A fish is happy in the water. Now, there's no happiness in material life, but it's a, it's a mundane analogy. The fish, once it's taken out of water, you can give him food to eat, you can give Miss Fish to have sex with, you can, whatever you give to the fish, the fish will never be happy. The fish has to go back to the water. So similarly, our nature is spiritual. The technical term for our spiritual nature is Satchit Ananda, which means eternal, full of bliss, and full of knowledge. In this material existence, we are born, and we die again and again in ignorance. We don't. We, we have a non, a seemingly non-eternal existence. Uh, we are ignorant of our actual position and happiness. We find happiness in useless things, which which do not satisfy us because we're not in our proper position, which is our spiritual position. 
in the spiritual world, spiritual existence. Now, I was talking about those who imagine themselves to be one with everything, and I see there are lectures out there on YouTube on Vedanta. Generally, Vedanta is advertised as being some idea of merging into the oneness. And what I've said so far, a lot of it would be approved by those spiritualists who promote Vedanta, Advaita Vedanta, the idea that we study the spiritual knowledge which was promulgated in India with the idea of becoming one. They probably approve of much of this because what I'm saying is Satchitananda. These are just common terms and it's technical terms, but in the Vedanta schools, th these are common terms. <clears throat> now, those who are teaching Vedanta on the internet, I hope if they're actually teaching, that they teach that you have to have discipline in order to become self-realized. Rules are needed. Discipline is needed. Self-control is needed. It's not simply a matter of imagining oneself to be a spiritualist. The discipline, rules, these are needed for purification of consciousness. Now, we probably lose a lot of people right there, which is why a lot of so-called spiritual teachers, they teach all lofty sounding things like becoming one with the universe, but they don't teach that we need to follow a rigid life of discipline and rules to even begin to become purified. They don't teach that because they would lose people right there, which is why I probably lost a lot of the viewers so far because it, there may have been those who were looking out of curiosity, but then when they found, well, it's... Uh, it's not, an, it's not a bubblegum fix. I want bubblegum instant happiness. And then there are just, uh, well, there are billions of videos out there. Why listen to some, some other guy who thinks he knows what he's talking about? Yeah, so many people. So many people talking. This, this, that, that. You should do this. You should do that. Try this. Try that. Well... What's my qualification? My qualification is this much. At least I, re I realized early in this life that there's no happiness in this material world. Reincarnation is a fact. We are, I am not God. <laughs> it's laughable, isn't it? I am not God. I have to serve God, but God isn't that some nasty figure sitting in the sky throwing people into hell as his main occupation and chuckling as he does so. The whole idea of trying to enjoy this material world is a great mistake. That much I have understood and I've studied and I've learned and I'm simply trying to communicate with others. I don't have a, this much I can say, I don't have anything to gain by talking to you. I, I, all these things. What do I gain? Well, I get I maybe get a few likes on YouTube. I don't really care. I'm not out for I'm not out for what is this popularity? There mean so many popular people, but just like John Lennon, I gave that example. He was he was popular, but he wasn't happy. His popularity was a b nuisance for him because he couldn't go anywhere without being. His fame was such that he couldn't go anywhere without people mobbing him. Oh, apart from that, I have, yeah, I've dedicated most of this life since I came in contact with this with studying and learning and following the discipline. It's, a, it's not such a rigorous discipline that you have to sit in some cave without eating, eat a handful of rice every three days. It's not such, it, actually, it's a very happy and blissful life, but there is discipline. Otherwise, without that, there's, it's just, it's just cheating. If someone tells you you can make spiritual advancement, but they don't tell you, you have to follow some basic rules, such as 
no meat eating, no illicit sex, no intoxication. They don't tell you these basic things, then basically they're cheating you, that's all, because you can't indulge in sense gratification and at the same time make spiritual advancement. Okay, so what is all this real happiness, this spiritual happiness? What's it all about? You're getting bored. It's almost half an hour now and still getting, didn't get to the point. Well, it may take us millions of lifetimes to get to the point. That Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, Bahunam Jamanamante Gyanavan Maam Prapadyate Vasudeva Sarvamiti Samahatma Sudurlaba. For those of you who don't understand, it might sound like a bunch of gobbledygook but it's actually from Bhagavad Gita, the most profound spiritual knowledge. Lord Krishna teaches in this one out of 700 verses, teaches that it may be after many, many lifetimes that someone is trying to find out the essence of spiritual knowledge. And after many lifetimes, they may come to the point of actually understanding it. And what is that? That Krishna himself is all in all. Such a person understanding this surrenders to Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. But such a great person is very rare. So real happiness means to come to, again, technical terms. If we're going to get into any topic with medicine or physics or uh, even, I don't know, breakdancing or something, they must have some technical terms, in, but whatever it is. Uh, musicology, there are so many technical terms. You like to listen to music, but if we can really get into music, it's such a, whether it's... Uh, Western music or Eastern music, a lot of technicality. So a technical term for real happiness, it's found in what is called the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, which is not fully translatable into English because after all, English language was developed on the basis of gross sense gratificatory society, uh, brutal society with a veneer of gentility. Uh, it wasn't developed on the basis of spiritual culture, although Christianity was a major feature in the Anglosphere until, well, it, it was a defining feature, not, not in England anymore. Anyway, Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, this term means the ocean, an unlimited ocean of nectar, bliss, beyond death. The nectar that derives from, and we say the word bhakti, and then we could spend days discussing what means bhakti. Bhakti means the, 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 the unlimited ocean of the nectarian bliss on the platform of deathlessness beyond birth and death that derives from the feelings that arise in the heart of someone who is absorbed in pure devotional service without any personal motive, simply giving themselves in love to Krishna. That's all summarized in the term Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu. Happiness means love. Love means on the plat eternal platform. Love in this material world gives happiness and it gives distress. We love but then we are distressed because our, our, the loved one dies or we die and we're separated. Or even in this lifetime, love turns to, to distress or it's mixed. Real love means selfless. The object of love should be one, the person who we love, 
fully able to reciprocate. You may not believe this. If you don't believe it, well, it's your bad luck. That's all I can say. Yeah, it may be after many lifetimes one can come to this, but we can simply request that you try it. If you, if you, you may have tried. Actually, we've tried so many things, not just in this lifetime, but in so many lifetimes. We've tried to be happy in so many ways. So many ways means it's basically, basically centered around the tongue, belly, and the genitals. And then when we come to human life, maybe it's centered on the intellectual platform a little, little bit. This is something from beyond the mundane mind, even beyond the mundane mind, transcending all intellectualism and all the highbrow stuff, Shakespeare, Beethoven, all, transcending all of that on a different platform altogether. You can try. It's very simple. Theoretically, it's simple. We have to stop all kinds of activities that will entangle us in material consciousness and chant the holy names of Krishna. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. There's your guaranteed happiness for you. Now, say, what? I listen for 30 minutes and you just come up with some mumbo jumbo. Don't think like that. All the greatest transcendentalists worship these names of Krishna by repeatedly chanting them. We, all of us, because we're all by nature spiritual beings, can, can come to the ocean of bliss, the nectar of devotion. There we go, Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu. In brief, we can call it the nectar of devotion. Try it and see. Try this chanting. It does help very much if we're in association with devotees of Krishna already on this path. Uh, it helps us to control the mind and senses which are always pulling us to the lower instant dopamycine, bubblegum, so-called happiness. Read these books of Srila Prabhupada. There's one book he's written called The Nectar of Devotion. It's all, it's not his own idea. It's all based on the same spiritual science that has been handed down since time immemorial. In fact, the, his rendering of the, the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu that's the name of a book in Sanskrit, which Srila Prabhupada translated in English as The Nectar of Devotion, and he subtitled it The Complete Science of Bhakti Yoga. Bhakti Yoga, the yoga of devotion. It's called a science because, as in science, if we, if we perform certain actions in a certain way under controlled conditions, we can expect a guaranteed a result. If we burn hydrogen in an atmosphere which contains oxygen, it means the hydrogen will react with oxygen, and then we condense the gas, we get water. It's predictable. It's predictable that if we take water and freeze it below zero degrees Celsius, it will become solidified. It's predictable. It's science. So in the same way, if we follow the process given purvai purvataram kritam by Gita, Bhagavad Gita again says, this is a process which has been followed by great personalities in the past. It's nothing new. So Srila Prabhupada presented that. You can read his books. He's very uh, expertly, very uh, clearly presented this ancient science in uh, English language, which is quite amazing in itself. 
the process is, is not difficult to follow, but it's difficult. It's not difficult to follow means you, you don't have to perform very harsh austerities or sit for hours trying to meditate or any such thing. Chant Hare Krishna, follow these principles. But it's difficult because we find it difficult. We're not accustomed. Anyway, Srila Prabhupada has translated many books, including uh, Bhagavad Gita, giving the uh, true devotional commentary. Read those books and be convinced. Why believe me? I, I'm just one, but read those books. That will help you. And for those who are already in Krishna consciousness, which is probably the majority of people listening to this, because who's interested to listen to me? I, I, it should be uh, we, we, that the, the people of the world listen to the propagators of Krishna consciousness, but people are wrapped up in their own foolish, tiny, small-minded things. They're not, so it's mostly people already interested in Krishna consciousness who are listening to this. But those already listening to this, they may think, yeah, guaranteed happiness from that's true. When I chant Hare Krishna, it's great, but still, it's an ongoing struggle with the mind and the senses. It's not, it's not instant. It's guaranteed, but it's not instant. Like It's the same thing. If one goes to medical college, first one has to be uh, admitted. One has to be qualified enough to be admitted, and then applies oneself then in course of time, it can be expected that the person can become a doctor. But it's, it's there, it's guaranteed, but it's not cheap, it's not easy. We have to apply ourselves. So those who are in Krishna consciousness already, most fortunately, after many, many, many lifetimes, we have this opportunity. So we shouldn't become disheartened because of the struggle. There is a struggle. And it's guaranteed formula, but we, to stick to the formula can be difficult. When it's, it's so much easier just to indulge in some petty sense gratification, but we have to keep the higher goal in mind. And we have to get ch charged up with the with the hope, the prospect uh, that, yes, I'm on the path back to Krishna, back to Godhead, and experience, we, we can do that. There's no reason why we shouldn't experience the bliss of Krishna consciousness all the time. I may say, well, sounds a long way away, but here for you, for here's something to keep us all going, those of us who are in Krishna consciousness, those who are aiming to go back to Godhead. Here's something to keep us going. Here's something that will I'm guaranteeing, especially for those who are already in Krishna consciousness, they're not going to be skeptical. They're, they'll understand and appreciate this advice. Here's the advice. I'm going to quote one verse from Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita. Chaitanya Charitamrita Nitta Koropan Jaha Hoite Premananda Bhakti Tattva Gyan. The author of Chaitanya Charitamrita, Sri Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami, who in Chaitanya Charitamrita says, actually, I'm not the author. I'm just like a puppet. And the actual authors are, the actual author is Madan Gopal, Krishna. I'm just, he, he moves me as a puppet, as a puppeteer. I'm the puppet. So he says, I'll translate this verse. Chaita, always drink the nectar of Chaitanya Charitamrita. Always, nitta, kor, nitta means always, can mean daily. Regularly drink the, read Chaitanya Charitamrita. Nitta koropan jaha hoite. From which we will get premananda, the bliss of love of Krishna. It may you may say, bliss of love of Krishna, that's a long way away. It's not far away. Open up your Chaitanya Charitamrita. At least we will, we may not be overwhelmed with the bliss that Raghunath Das Goswami was, ex, 
experiencing intensely at every moment, but we'll get a guaranteed happiness formula, guaranteed we will get at least some touch of that. And even a little touch of the bliss of Krishna consciousness was far superior to all the so-called happiness in the material world put together that we can experience. It's not... Now I'm not talking about something, something theoretical, go to Krishna, dance in Vrindavan, all this kind of thing. It may seem theoretical. This is practical. Open Chaitanya Charitamrita, read it. Jaha hoite premananda bhakti tattva gyan. And we'll also get knowledge about the process of devotional service. I'm going to read a few verses from Chaitanya Charitamrita. I'll read the Bengali with Srila Prabhupada's translation, just to buttress what I've been saying. Krishna Lila Amrita Shah Tar Shata Shata Dha Dashtike Bahe Jaha Hoite Shai Chaitanya Lila Hoi Sharobar Akhoi Manohangsha Charaho Tahate the pastimes of Lord Krishna are the essence of all nectar. And that nectar is flowing in hundreds of rivers in all directions. The pastimes of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu are an eternal reservoir. And one is advised to let his mind swim like a swan on this transcendental lake. Bhaktagan Shunama Doina Bachan. Tom, this is uh, the author saying, uh, Listen, I'll tell you one more thing. Very humbly, I'm telling you, I'll tell you one more thing. He goes on to say, Kri Krishna Bhakti Siddhanta Gon, Jate Profula Paddaban. Tar madhu kari ashadan Prema rasha kumud bane Profulito ratri dine Tate charao mano bringa gan Devotional service to Krishna is, as, is exactly like a pleasing jubilant forest of lotus flowers wherein there is ample honey. I request everyone to taste this honey. If all the mental speculators bring the bees of their minds into this forest of lotus flowers and jubilantly enjoy ecstatic love of Krishna day and night, their mental speculation will be completely, transcendentally satisfied. Nana bhave bhakta jan hangsha chakra bhakagon jate shabe karen biha Krishna Keli Sumirnal Jahapai Sharbakal Bhakta Hongsha Koraye Aha. The devotees who have a relationship with Krishna are like the swans and chakravaka birds who play in that forest of lotus flowers. The buds of those lotus flowers are the pastimes of Krishna and they are edibles for the swan-like devotees. Lord Sri Krishna is always engaged in his transcendental pastimes. Therefore, the devotees following in the footsteps of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu can always eat those lotus buds for they are the pastimes of the Lord. Shisharo bare gia hong sha chakra ba ka hoya shadata ha koro ho bilash kondi be shokol duk paiba paramashuk onayashe ho be premo lash. All the devotees of Sri Chaitanya Maha Prabhu should go to that lake and remaining always under. The shelter of the lotus feet of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu becomes swans and chakravaka birds in those celestial waters. They should go on rendering service to Lord Sri Krishna and enjoy life perpetually. In this way, all miseries will be diminished. The devotees will attain great happiness 
and there will be jubilant love of God. E Amrita Anukhan Shadu Mahanta Megagon Bishodane Kore Borishon Tate Fale Amrita Fall Bhaktakai Nirantar Tar She She Jie Jagajan The devotees who have taken shelter of the lotus feet of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu take the responsibility for distributing nectarian devotional service all over the world. They are like clouds pouring water on the ground that nourishes the fruit of love of Godhead in this world. The devotees eat that fruit to their heart's content and whatever remnants they leave are eaten by the general populace. Thus they live happily. Chaitanya Lila Amritapur, Krishna Lila Shukarpur, Duhe Mili Hoi Shumadhurja, Shadhu Guru Prashade Taje Ashvade, Shejane Madhurja Prachurja. The pastimes of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu are full of nectar, and the pastimes of Lord Krishna are like camphor. When one mixes this, when one mixes these, they taste very sweet. By the mercy of the pure devotees, whoever tastes them can understand the depths of that sweetness. Jilila Amrita Bine Kai Jodi Onapane Tobe Bhakter Durbal Jibon Jarek Bindupane Utpoli Utfulita tonumone hashegai koraye narton. Men become strong and stout by eating sufficient grains. But the devotee who simply eats ordinary grains but does not taste the transcendental pastimes of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and Krishna gradually becomes weak and falls down from the transcendental position. However, if one drinks but a drop of the nectar of Krishna's pastimes, his body and mind begin to bloom, and he begins to laugh, sing, and dance. E amrita karopan jarsham nahiyan chite kare sujura bishash na paro kutarka gorte Omeda kakorsha borte jate parile hoy sharvanash. The readers should relish this wonderful nectar because nothing compares to it. Keeping their faith firmly fixed within their minds, they should be careful not to fall into the pit of false arguments or the whirlpools, the whirlpools of unfortunate situations. If one falls into such positions, he is finished. This uh, was a reading from Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita Madhalila, chapter 25, from text 271 on. And read it yourself. Enjoy the bliss. Uh, there's no doubt the world around us is completely crazy and getting crazier all the time. Even in our Vaishnav society, there are so many things which can cause disturbance to our mind. But despite all of this, Chaitanya Charitamrita Nitta Koropan, let us remember the pastimes of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and the nectarian pastimes regularly, daily, as much as possible. Instant bliss. And keep our sights fixed. We're meant for that. We are meant for this nectar. We're not meant for the pettiness of this material world. Study Chaitanya Charitamrita. At least we may not be able to avoid all the difficulties of this world, but that will keep us on the transcendental platform, even though we there are so many cares, troubles, anxieties. By the grace of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, we'll be lifted up and above that. And if we remain in this consciousness, thinking of Gaura, Gaura, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Sri Krishna, Chaitanya Prabhu, Nityananda, 
Shirveda Garadha, Shivasadi Gaur Bhakta Vrinda. Then surely, Yang Yang Vapi, Smaran Bhavam, Tyajan Deva, Kalevarang, Tang Tame, Vaiti Kontaya, Sadatad Bhava Bhavitaha. If during this life we think of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu with the desire to somehow, some life, join in his dancing pastimes, then we can be sure that before very long we will also have the opportunity to see with our own eyes that beautiful prachanda sharia, huge form of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu dancing in bliss. And what more, what else? Bliss, 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 guaranteed happiness formula. Vancha kalpa tarupyas chakripa sindhubya evaja. Patita nam pavane bhyo vaishnave bhyo namo namaha. Dante nidhaya chuna kang padaya nipatya krit vaja kaku shatame tada ham bravimi. He sadhava sakala eva bihaya durat. Goranga chandra charane kurutano. Pari vadatu jano yata tata va nanu mukaro navayang vicharayama. Hari rasa madira madati mata bhuvi vilutama natama nirvishama. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna, Krishna.